You're ready. That's good. Yeah. Well, so I realize this is a very uh, critical uh, time of the day. Uh, I'll try and earn your attention for the next 10 minutes. Um, I work as an architect, so that is, I'm a practitioner rather than a researcher. So, uh, yeah, this might be something different from what we have just seen. Uh, very interesting for me to hear about your research about classrooms. Um, I'm here to talk about architectural atmosphere in learning environments and to show uh, examples of how to work with daylight in practice in a classroom. Um, Historically, um, daylight has been a very important role uh, in uh, school building in, in a Scandinavian context. Um, are you overruling? No? Yes. What's going on? Yes? <laughs> yes? No? Okay, this is uh, a different presentation than I <laughs> imagined. <laughs> yeah? Okay. Um, we have, well, today there is uh, several academic studies that show the positive effects of daylight on uh, students' well-being and uh, performance in schools. Um, in a Norwegian context, uh, which I represent today, uh, we have uh, a debate going on about how to actually implement uh, the research that we have about uh, daylight in architectural practice. For instance, uh, Leif Hauk, researcher and architect, is uh, arguing that TECT, that is the building regulation, and the general focus on the environment in the social debate may have contributed to a shifted focus amongst architects from providing optimal daylight conditions to saving energy. So this is, this is an ongoing debate. Um, so far, it hasn't changed the requirements for, for school buildings or the regulations for school buildings. And uh, just to, to say a bit about that, uh, today there is a demand for 2% daylight average daylight factor in primary educational spaces. Uh, as practitioners in Norway, we see that there is a growing awareness and interest amongst clients and uh, a tendency to, towards higher project-specific requirements, um, for instance, in the case study that I'm going to present later. Um, my focus here today is to ask how we as practitioners translate the specified minimum requirements into actually inspiring spaces for the students. There are many ways of uh, reaching a specific daylight factor, uh, depending on geometry, surfaces, etc. So how do we actually do that in a way that uh, supports the learning principles of that school? Um, so we would like to ask how we uh, go from uh, talking about uh, daylight as lux or um, the measurable uh, lux level to a more holistic approach to atmosphere in the classroom. Um, for instance, Lone Stiesen has been working with this light atmosphere model and she's trying to unfold that there are different parameters that affect the way we perceive uh, the lighting of a space. Um, I'm not going to go into detail here, I'm going to use the model later. Uh, it's just to show that uh, in her uh, point of view there are uh, several uh, factors, the uses, the time, the space as well as the light source that affects our perception of the, the space. Um, I'm going to talk about Vestmyr Skole in Fauske in the far north. Um, I was just talking to, uh, to one of the researchers here about how far north. Uh, it's uh, by Bodø, if anyone knows that. Yeah, <laughs> um, it's um, a project that we have been working on together with the Nordic Office of Architecture. So we are actually sitting in Oslo and uh, uh, working on this project. Um, it's a project where the client had a very, uh, they had an early focus on daylight due to this geographic, uh, geographic location in the far north. They set up a demand for uh, four to five percent average daylight factor in primary educational spaces, which is more ambitious than the two percent requirement. <laughs> but um, yeah, that was our point of, point of departure for for working with the daylighting uh, in in this school. 
Um, this is a perspective. And this is a plan drawing. It's a two-story uh, building, but I'm going to focus on this classroom uh, marked with green. Um, it's uh, it's uh, the primary space for the seventh grade students uh, in this school. Just have to say that this is a, it's a primary and middle and middle school. So and this is uh, this new part of the school, which is in this plan drawing, is from uh, fifth to tenth grade. Um, when talking to the user about the intended use of this space, um, uh, the key sentence was uh, differentiated learning um, situations and to create spaces which accommodate different ways of uh, teaching uh, within this single space. Here I have uh, listed some examples of situations. Uh, a classical presentation situation, groom group, and then more individual work. And I'm going to just talk about this more, uh, this, uh, this left image, how to create spaces within the space that accommodate more individual uh, immersion into a book, iPad, or uh, similar. Um, if we go back to this uh, model, uh, of light atmosphere, we see that we have uh, the user group here is uh, the seven, uh, seven great students uh, when doing individual work. Uh, they are familiar to this space. Um, they are using uh, the niches that we're trying to create as an integrated part of their uh, lessons, uh, so for shorter time frames. Uh, the light source is, uh, well, we are, of course, here mainly interested in the natural daylight, but it should, of course, be considered in connection with the artificial lighting. Um, from a functional point of view, we are looking to have an average of 5% daylight factor in the space, but also the opportunity to shade. Uh, from a more aesthetic point of view, to use uh, Lone Stiesen's words, we are looking to create a kind of cozy atmosphere, that's a bit of a fluffy term, but um, a more informal space for the students with attention to the seasonal variation. We are uh, looking to create a space that, um, a space within the space, uh, niches that um, provide a place to sit, a place to have a view from, their very scenic surroundings and there should be a good connection between the indoor spaces and the exterior. And then we are trying to implement uh, inviting materials uh, to create a more informal seating situation. Yeah, and then I have two uh, steps from the design process, uh, very simplified. Um, this is just to show two very different ways of uh, uh, reaching uh, a daylight factor, uh, an average day daylight factor of 5% in a space. So this first example is, uh, um, is a floor, floor plan of 7 times 10 meters with uh, uh, windows in one, one facade and a sill height of 850 millimeters. So this is... Uh, uh, one way of doing it, and this is another. Uh, this is not to talk about the, the aesthetics of the room, but more to say that there are different ways of reaching a daylight factor, and in our opinion, this gives more quality to the users. Here we have uh, spread the windows to two facades to get a more evenly lit uh, space. We have high windows and we have low windows, that is to get daylight deep into the space and have also very low... Um, windows that provide uh, seating for the students, a sill height of 450 millimeters, which is uh, something you don't really get credit for when you look at the, the average daylight factor. So we really had to argue for that this adds value to the space. Um, we are in the detailing, we've been working with applying uh, wooden frames and uh, cushions to provide a nice place to sit. So, yeah, uh, just to sum up, uh, this presentation was a way to kind of really highlight the importance of daylight in schools, but also to say that we think it's important to not only look at the quantifiable uh, things, the lux level, but also um, um, look at daylight from a more holistic point of view. 
This is the school, uh, an image from last week. So it's under construction, so not able to present evaluation. Hope to be able to do that at a later time. Thank you very much. <laughs>